don't know him.
to pray, say a prayer for you. Order. Now call the Standing Committee on Public Accounts to order. My name is Kelly Regan. I'm the MLA for Bedford Basin and I am the Chair of the Committee. Uh, reminder to all of our participants here today to please place your phones on silent and I will ask committee members to introduce themselves beginning with the member to my immediate left, Mr. Young. Uh, Nolan Young, MLA for Shelburne. MLA Taggart. Good morning and welcome. Tom Taggart, MLA for Colchester North. MLA McDonald. Good morning, Johnny McDonald, MLA for Hans East. MLA, MLA Sheehy Richard. Good morning and welcome. Melissa Sheehy Richard, I'm the MLA for Hans West. MLA Burl. G Gary Burl, I represent Halifax Shabucto, and uh, Susan LeBlanc, uh, who represents Dartmouth North, is going to be along later in the meeting. Emily Coombs. Hi, Emily. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Coombs, uh, the, the MLA for Key Friends Centre, Whitney Pier. <laughs> Emily McGuire. Uh, good morning, Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Emily Smith. Hi, everyone. Thanks. My name is Kent Smith. I'm the MLA for the Eastern Shore. On today's agenda, we have officials with us from the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the Office of the Fire Marshal. With respect to the 2023 report of the Auditor General, Provincial Fire Safety Management, Office of the Fire Marshal. Um, and just normally I do this ahead of the meeting, but I was a little delayed in traffic this morning. So just a reminder to folks that um, um, I will call on you when it's time to speak. And so until, until that happens, your mic won't be open and you won't be able to uh, be reflected in the record. So just, just a reminder about that. So I will um, now ask our witnesses to introduce themselves, beginning with Deputy LaFlesche. Paul LaFlesche, the Deputy of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing, Seniors and Long-Term Care. Mr. McKenzie, I'm not sure whether whether I say Mr. McKenzie or Marshall McKenzie, but uh, Mr. McKenzie? Uh, Doug McKenzie, uh, Provincial Fire Marshal, Director of the Office of the Fire Marshal. Uh, Ms. Potty Bunge? Good morning, uh, Valerie Potty Bunge, De Associate Deputy Minister of Municipal Affairs. And Mr. Mason? Paul Mason, Executive Director, Emergency Management Office. Uh, Mr. LaFleche, or Deputy LaFleche, you have up to five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting us here to speak about the Auditor General's 2023 report on the Office of the Fire Marshal. First, I would like to begin by saying that we respect the findings and accept the recommendations provided in the report. Before we get into the details of the report, I want to assure Nova Scotians that staff in the Office of the Fire Marshal are professionals who are focused and dedicated to protecting people from fires and ensuring that our buildings are safe. I want to point out as well that the audit period covered a time during the COVID-19 pandemic when access to buildings and travel throughout the province was restricted. As well, during the period, key members of the senior management team were in acting roles due to secondments. This put additional demands on existing staff at that time. I am pleased to see that we have a new senior management team in place and we are continuing to work to address any staff vacancies that remain. Mr. McKenzie has been the fire marshal for about a year now uh, as a permanent appointment. He was acting for a while before that. I think it is extremely important to point out, as the Auditor General noted in her report, the Deputy Fire Marshals and Fire Marshal Inspectors understand very well their roles. That is key. They know what they're doing and are focused on their mandate. Each year, Nova Scotia's Deputy Fire Marshals visit more than 1,300 buildings generating inspection reports and orders to take action, as well as documents and correspondence to promote and support fire and building safety throughout the province. The office also conducts training activities, reviews buildings, plans, and responds to close to 200 requests a year from municipal fire departments and police for support, including more than 75 fire and investigations annually. What the report identified were some administrative issues and gaps in internal processes. Admittedly, they are not good, but they are being addressed. Fire safety is a shared responsibility under the Fire Safety Act. Municipalities are responsible to ensure their legislative and the mandated inspections are complete. As the Auditor General pointed out, we can do more to ensure that is happening. We will explore 
what, what those opportunities may look like. Madam Chair, I want you and the committee to know that we take the Auditor General's report very seriously. And to demonstrate that point, I'm pleased to say that two of the recommendations are already complete out of the seven. Two others are almost done and, and will be completed very soon, and the remaining three are well underway. On that note, I can tell you without hesitation, both myself and the Minister have full confidence in the Office of the Fire Marshal and their work. With that, I think I've given you back the time I stole two weeks ago, so I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Deputy. In fact, I think you came in at about three minutes. So, yeah, that is uh, some of the time you stole uh, a couple of weeks. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just for the folks who are making their first appearance here, we start off with uh, rounds of questioning from each of the caucuses, 20 minutes for each caucus. And then there's a further uh, round of questioning that depends on how much business we have at the end of the meeting um, and how long the opening statement was so we should have a good hefty period of time to, for our second round as well. So we will begin now with the Liberal Caucus, MLA McGuire. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just get to fire off a quick, uh, couple quick questions. First, thank you, the deputy, for a tie. Much appreciate it. Um, are there enough staff in the office of the fire marshal to appropriately address the labor demand? Uh, uh, deputy of the flesh. Well, that's a, an amazing question. It's, it, it's a good one. We ask that question about every service we provide in government. And um, as those of you here who have been uh, in government or on Treasury Board know, it's always a, a difficult question. It's one of the most serious questions we have to address at budget side for any department. In terms of the actual office of the fire marshal, uh, I will allow the, uh, the fire marshal uh, himself to address what he thinks the staffing levels should be. Uh, Mr. McKenzie. Thank you. Um, as part of the Auditor General's report, uh, the Department is committed to a review of our office and our uh, legislative mandate, uh, and I think that uh, resources will be part of that full review. Emily McGuire. So the question was, is there enough? Uh, not uh, respectfully if the Auditor General thinks there's enough or not. Uh, you guys are all on the ground. You know if there's enough staff or not. So the question is, is there enough deputy fire marshals to carry out the inspections needed? Mr. Mr. McKenzie. Um, we, we experienced some staffing shortages uh, over the period, over the last couple of years actually, uh, and uh, recruitment is, uh, it's a competitive market that we're dealing with right now. Uh, a recent competition saw four individuals withdraw uh, for uh, uh, compensation reasons, uh, but we are looking forward at uh, being fully staffed shortly. Uh, we have a posting out right now, and uh, I believe we'll be able to uh, fulfill the mandate on the inspection side in the coming years. Mr. McGuire. What's the salary for a deputy, starting salary for a deputy fire marshal? Mr. McKenzie. Thank you. Uh, it's about 78000 Now, these are highly uh, technical positions, and the pool of candidates is limited. Uh, these are um, the subject matter experts in their field in several areas, uh, whether it be building, inspect or building official, fire official, and fire certified fire investigator. So the pool that we can draw from is limited. Um, so that's uh, part of the rationale for having difficulty in filling positions. There's also a requirement to have a, a large number of years of experience in the field. Uh, we have had candidates that met the, the minimum requirements but didn't have that depth of knowledge and experience that we would draw on because they are the leaders uh, for the municipal uh, inspectors to go to for clarification on the acts and regulations and to assist them in making decisions. Emily McGuire. So 12 of the 30 properties are past their due date for inspections, which is a troubling thing. Um, I asked the deputy, could we get a regional breakdown? Uh, can that be provided in the location of those 12 that are past their due dates? And could we have that uh, sent to the committee? Yes. Um, Mr. Mr. LaFleche? That was uh, probably at the time of the report. Uh, I'll ask the fire marshal to address uh, where we are now and uh, what data we can get by when. 
Mr. McKenzie. Yeah, uh, we can get that data for you. I can confirm of those uh, properties, uh, there was no orders to take action issued when they were inspected. So the maintenance staff in those properties were maintaining the buildings in a safe manner as part of our fire safety planning. Um, I can give you documentation today if you wish. Uh, I have a, a, a graph on that. Uh, so we can provide that for you. MLA McGuire. So, Madam Chair, we're just asking that they table which of the 12 of the 30 properties that are past their uh, uh, inspection date as of the Auditor General's report. So, I ask that we send that out to the department um, and have that tabled for the committee. Uh, there was also four large public housing units that were missing from the inspection list provided by the Office of the Fire Marshal to the Auditor General. Which, what are those four large public housing units? Where are they? Uh, Mr. McKenzie? Uh, those were in the Halifax area. Um, I don't have the exact names and locations with me. Uh, if you wish, I can get that for you. Uh, the issue with those uh, units were that uh, the uh, three of the buildings were actually being inspected by Halifax Fire under the MOU. Uh, that's where the confusion was. It wasn't part of our inventory list. Uh, the inventory list that the Office of the Fire Marshal uh, has is only for the buildings that they inspect. Each municipal unit is responsible for maintaining their own list. Emily McGuire. Yeah, Madam Chair, if we could get that that uh, those four sites, uh, those four unit uh, housing units, if we get that table to the uh, to the committee, that would be excellent. Um, so here's one of the things that the Auditor General uh, really, I think, honed in on, which was a hundred percent of inspection files tested did not have the appropriate supporting evidence. 100% did not have the appropriate, appropriate supporting evidence. If this was health, if this was education, if this was, well, if it was justice, you'd be thrown out of the court, right? Um, so my, my question is, how can we, the public, uh, have confidence in these inspections? How can we, uh, rely on the integrity of these inspections if there's no evidence supporting it. So my question is, um, why did we get to that? How did we get to that? And did no one flag that in the department to say, 100% of the inspections have zero supporting evidence? Mr. McKenzie. It's a why question. Yep, no, and, it, and it's a good question. Um, it. Uh, the, the inspections are being done, the, the follow-up paperwork is being done. Every inspection that a deputy fire marshal does generates documentation and is in our software system. So whether that's a letter of compliance or a housekeeping letter for them to take care of small items uh, or in order to take action. The crux of the issue was um, this here document, which is a record of inspection that we utilized. It's a triplicate form. Uh, we did away with this uh, as we were moving to doing our inspections digitally. Uh, we're going to be passing that out today. Uh, so when we moved to move to go digitally, we did away with that and we didn't adju adjust our inspection policy. So that was still contained within the policy. So according to the Auditor General, we weren't following the policy and that document wasn't being completed. That's, that's why the inspection records show 100%. The inspections were done, all the records are being kept, all the information is there. Uh, since, pardon me, sorry. Since, uh, since the AG's report, uh, the, our digital format hasn't worked out to, the, to the, our, our, our hopes. So I've reinstituted the triplicate format uh, form uh, until such time as we implement our new software system, which will have the audit capabilities that the Auditor General is looking for. Emily McGuire. So are you saying there is supporting evidence on every single inspection that was done? 100%. Oh, sorry. Mr. Mr. McKenzie. 100%. Okay. Um, so MLA McGuire. I guess my question is, why wasn't that made available to the Auditor General during her inspection, during her um, investigation and audit? Mr. McKenzie. All the information was provided to the Auditor General. The Office of the Fire Marshal was as cooperative and as transparent as we could be. MLA McGuire. So... The, I want to go back to the public housing part of this because 
Uh, we do know that um, when it comes to public housing in particular, there is a lot of um, um, <coughs> repairs that are in a rare. Uh, and that can lead to major, major issues. So I have a large public housing um, uh, unit in my community. Um, we've had to beg and plead um, since I've been in MLA to get money um, from all governments uh, to, to have roofs done, windows done, to have this done, have that done. So it is a little troubling to me that uh, the most vulnerable population that we have in some of the, we'll say, least maintained public government owned properties um, is are being left off of the inspection. Um, so my question is, do you prioritize some of these properties, especially the ones that are seeing deferred maintenance and seeing some of the most vulnerable population? You know, we have people in Greystone, for example, I spoke to a lady yesterday who's being moved out of her unit um, into an a apartment building and she has mobility issues. She said, if there's a fire, I'm, I'm done. But also, if you go to her unit, it's probably not the safest unit either. So the, we have a lot of individuals with mobility issues. We have individuals with all kinds of different physical issues uh, that are in these units. Uh, so my question is, um, do you prioritize it? And, and do we not see the, the trouble, the troubling, um, part of this report where there was public housing units left off of uh, the inspections. Uh, Mr. McKenzie. Well, again, the the units uh, were being inspected by Halifax Fire, the ones that were on, off the list. Uh, there was one building that we uh, were responsible for that uh, was not, not on our list. Um, <clears throat> I believe it may have been with the changeover of all the housing authorities where we missed that. So, But it's it's been inspected within 30 days of being notified of it being on our list. Um, as for the uh, maintenance, um, part of our program is our deputies, uh, when they're inspecting, is, is to have the maintenance supervisor staff with them when they go around to do the inspection to educate them as to what we are looking for, what their responsibilities are in maintaining the fire and life safety systems. Uh, when we do an inspection, we are only inspecting for fire and life safety systems. We're not inspecting for w windows or whatever. So that's, that's the scope of our work. Emily McGuire. Um, <coughs> was the purchased hotel at Hogan Court, was that inspected by the office of the fire marshal before purchase? Mr. McKenzie. No, we were not part of that conversation. Uh, we are working with our partners at uh, TIR and uh, they're developing a plan to convert the uh, hotel to the uh, needs of the proposed occupants uh, and we're waiting on health for that as well. So, so, so <clears throat> that, I just want to get this straight. <clears throat> oh, MLA McGuire. <laughs> I just want to get this straight. Government spent uh, 30, 40 million, whatever it is for that building at the time. And there was no, I'm not asking about going forward. I mean, you know, when I purchased my house, I had to have someone come in and inspect the house, right? That was part of it with the bank, right? We, there was water testing and, and safety and all kinds of different things that had to be done. Uh, I'm not going to pretend like I know it all, because uh, uh, truthfully, my wife dealt with it all, but um, she's better than that stuff than I am. So, um, but the truth is, is that this government just purchased a hotel for $40 million and there was no fire inspection. There was nothing from the provincial fire marshal that was done pre-purchase, not post-purchase, but pre-purchase. Mr. McKenzie. Um, that's correct. The, the hotel was under a building permit with Halifax Fire, and the Halifax uh, building official would be the authority having jurisdiction. The Office of the Fire Marshal doesn't have any authority under the Building Code Act uh, for new construction, um, and nor do we do inspections for post-purchase things. So my assumption would be that uh, TIR, who was involved in this, would have been doing the inspections and would have followed up with the inspections completed by Halifax Building. Mr. McGuire. Respectfully, this is not a new construction, though. You, we, they bought a building that was in a state of construction. Uh, it's not a new construction, right? Uh, a new construction would be a piece of land cleared and a build. This was a property that sat 
as is for years and should have been inspected by the province before a purchase. So um, I, I understand going forward that this is a renovation and I guess they could technically say it's a new build. It's not a new build, it's, it's a renovation because uh, there is a difference between the two. Uh, but uh, this, this building was uh, sat in uh, its current state for years. So it is a little troubling to me that, that it wasn't inspected by the provincial fire marshal and that this thing was just uh, rushed into. I want to I wanna jump over to a different topic quickly. Um, so there's 13,000 inspections province-wide. So we're going to divide that by 10 fire marshals. Uh, each of those fire marshals are now responsible for 1,300 inspections annually, excluding weekends and holidays. And I, I will tell you that I didn't do the math. Someone better at math did this. So there are roughly 269 days, days of standard working days for each deputy to comp complete these. 269 days by eight hours per day equates to 2,152 annual working hours. Considering this, each inspection would be completed in about one hour and 40 minutes, including travel, paperwork, etc., in order for them to be completed on time and all 13,000 to be completed by those 10 deputies. One hour and 40 minutes for travel, paperwork, and inspection per. It, that's, those are the numbers. Those are the hard facts. Is that enough time to do an inspection? Four including and travel and paperwork. Four and a half minutes left in your time, okay. Mr. McKenzie. Um, I, I just, it, the, the number I believe was 1,300, not yeah. 13,000. Yeah. Yeah. 1,300 per? No, 1,300 13 total. Total? Yes. Sites inspected, okay. So. And some, some inspections can be done in, you know, a site inspection, half an hour, so a couple hours for an inspection. Other inspections may take a week, it, they, they vary. And, so, ahead, and some, of our, some of the inspections completed are surprise pop-in inspections. If a deputy is driving by, he'll pop in, or if it's a property that we're, we've been having some issues at, it'll be inspected more frequently. Mr. McGuire. So then when, it, when I saw the number 13,000, it explained to me in my head, I was like, okay, maybe this is why they're not completing it. But if it's 1,300, that's 130 inspections per year. Why are they not being completed? Why is the paperwork not being done? Why, why, why are we in the situation we're currently in right now? Um, it, with the other numbers that, we, that I thought we had, um, it kind of explained to me, I was like, they are stretched thin. Um, and not to say they're not doing a lot of work, but we, we've had some troubling things from the Auditor General, and if it's 130 a year, why, are they, why, why is this department failing on the Auditor General's report time after time after time? Mr. McKenzie. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, part of that relates back to it's not just 1,300 inspections a year. Uh, there's upwards of 70 to 100 fire investigations a year completed, which can range from anywhere from a day to a week at a time for multiple deputies. Uh, the deputies also provide training uh, to fire departments, uh, uh, municipal fire inspectors. Uh, they also have some training requirements around their own personal training to maintain certification. And we also face some significant uh, staffing challenges over the course of the last few years, especially during the course of the pandemic, uh, where we were covering uh, multiple territories with one deputy, so drive times were enhanced. Uh, and uh, the other thing was, uh, it was during the period of COVID where we were unable to get into buildings, so we had to adapt our inspection process. Uh, staff were talking to the caretakers of these buildings by phone and email constantly. Uh, however, they did do some inspections uh, virtually when they had problem areas they wanted to see. They did live video with them, and staff adapted and covered off where they could. Uh, but again, when you only have X number of people and you're supposed to have 10, there's, there's going to be shortcomings. Mr. McGuire. So, so respectfully, I, I'm going to ask you, 
uh, what is the ideal situation for staffing? It, it just sounds to me like a resource issue, and, and I'm not here to put the blame on anyone at this table. It does sound like this is a resource issue. We know that this is multiple uh, uh, requests and, and reports from the Auditor General. Uh, if you had a magic wand right now, how many deputy fire marshals would you have working for your department full time? Mr. McKenzie. That's a, uh, <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a good question. Um, we definitely need to look at uh, what we need to accomplish in the next few years and pr put a proposal forward. Uh, it's not only just deputies that we would be looking at, it may be other staffing with regard to the generational builds that we're involved with, our plans examination team as well, but currently we are pivoting our resources to uh, take care of the needs, the high priority items, and uh, we will catch up on the other items as we can. Mr. McGuire, 10 seconds. Uh, just say thank you. I know it's not an easy job. I know that those deputies go through a lot. I know all of you go through a lot. It's a lot on your shoulders. Order. Uh, time has elapsed for the Liberal uh, questioning. We will ma now move on to the NDP caucus. Ms. Coombs. Thank you. Uh, there's, some, there's something I want to clarify from the um, questioning of my colleague from the Liberals. Mr. McKenzie, you stated that all the documents were available to the Auditor General. Um, and so I'm, assume, I'm assuming you mean also the digital, but yet the AG found zero uh, compliance uh, regarding um, documents being completed um, or not available. And I'm trying to make sense of that. So can you explain what, why is there a difference between what the AG has said in, her, in, in the report that there was that there was that the documentation she found was 100% um, all documentation not completed, mm -hmm. and yet you said all the documents were there and and available. Mr. McKenzie. Yeah, so again, I think it centers around the uh, record of inspection that we uh, decided not to use as we move forward, and we did not adjust our policy. I believe that's where, they, um, uh, where the, the, the focus of that is. Um, the records were provided. Uh, our FDM system was, uh, their audit team was given permissions to enter into our FDM system, which is our file data management system, uh, to, to view all the, all the records. Every inspection creates uh, a file or an inspection report out of that system, so the information was there. So if there's confusion, you'd have to speak with the AG on that. Emily Coombs. Thank you. Um, and I don't know actually who to give this uh, question to, so hopefully we can figure this out when I make the question. And that is um, from Mr. McKenzie's um, uh, statements to my colleague here, stated that they went from, to digital and got rid of the, tripl uh, the triplicate, triplicate uh, documents. Um, and so I know in my office we have to hold, we can send in our digital copies to uh, the speaker's office, for instance, but we have to hold on to our paper copies. I'm just wondering um, why, you know, why, why is it that there was a difference in the pulse, if there was a difference that there's no longer need for copies, paper copies, um, and also, uh, and also, why was the policy not changed to reflect that there was no longer a need for Paul for that? Uh, Deputy LaFleche? So uh, I just want to separate two things there in the question. So if you're asking, uh, did we get rid of all our paper copies from past inspections? No. no. Okay. So you're talking about when we went forward and converted to electronic, why did we not also keep paper copies? Okay. Mr. McKenzie. Um, our file data management system was approved by the uh, file retention uh, group uh, for our records retention, so we no longer needed paper copies. And we were moving to what we had hoped at the time was a uh, on-site inspection format for the deputy to be able to 
complete the inspection uh, by a remote app. Um, unfortunately, it, the technology didn't support that, so we went back to just doing our regular inspections, and un I, we did not think to reinstitute the paper copy. So we've, we've done that. We're going to maintain that now until we have the uh, technical support of the new system to support us. Emily Coons. And, and I would agree. I, I would say that it is better to keep the copy papers until you know the system is working um, before you get rid of the paper copies altogether um, so that we can avoid situations such as this. And you mentioned the new system. When is that new system going to be coming into effect? Mr. McKenzie. Um, so some shortcomings were notified or noticed or mentioned in the AG's report with regards to our ability to provide oversight. So we couldn't uh, effectively show that we were uh, auditing what the work of all staff were doing in this system. So there's no time stamp. It's an older, it's an old antiquated version of a system that's been around for quite a while. So we're exploring uh, what options are available to us with uh, Nova Scotia Digital Services. We're also exploring with our current uh, provider of what their next gen system looks like because the system that we are currently on, has, we've been notified is going on end of life. Uh, we're on this system. It's different than most government systems because a lot of the fire service in Nova Scotia are on this system and it allows for them to provide us with the fire data uh, and reportings uh, that they're required to do under the legislation. Emily Coombs. So in the meantime, um, is your system going to be, what is, if I'm hearing you correctly and you can answer, um, what is the new system going to be? Is it going to be digital and paper, or is it paper? Like, how are you maintaining your system now and until you get the new system in place? Mr. McKenzie. Mm -hmm. So all of our inspections are entered digitally into the system. Um, the paper copy of the inspection report uh, that we will leave a copy on site will be the paper copy. Uh, letters are generated out of this system. Uh, they are also they are emailed and and, and snail mailed uh, to the to the recipients. Emily Coombs. Thank you. I'm going to switch off that now because just questions led into questions. Um, so. My colleague, we were discussing um, the reason regarding the late inspections. Um, you mentioned COVID as one, one of the issues. Um, and you alluded to, if I'm not mistaken, um, the sh staffing shortage. So is the late inspections due to um, the shortage in resources and, and staffing? Mr. McKenzie. Um, I would say it's a combination of everything. Um, you know, uh, uh, COVID impacted our ability to, uh, to inspect some buildings, and some buildings we had to get to in a hurry after, afterwards or when restrictions were lifted. Um, staffing is an issue. Um, I take, you know, Cape Breton County, for instance, um, we have three deputy fire marshals based out of the Sydney office. At one point, we only had one deputy fire marshal covering the entire island. Uh, so obviously, this, you know, there were there were shortcomings there. Um, we do our best to fill the positions as quickly as possible. But uh, for some, not only are they hard to fill, but sometimes we're not we're unable to fill them for a variety of reasons, and we have to absorb those inspections with other other staff members. So everyone pitches in, and we tackle the high priority items first, and we get to the rest as soon as we can. Emily Coombs. Um, are there any inspections um, overdue at this time? Mr. McKenzie. Uh, yes, I had staff do uh, run a, a check yesterday or the couple days ago. Um, staff are noting uh, that they do have some overdue inspections. Uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned in this uh, discussion is that uh, we also went through a period of um, uh, deputies changing territories. Um, I had the, the chessboard laid out how I thought things were going to work and somebody shook it up and, and so we had some handoff issues with retirements or people changing territories and the uh, inspections not being assigned to them. So uh, we're cleaning that up now and we're going to have that complete in the next few months. 
Emily Coombs. Thank you um, for the answer. And how many are overdue at this time? Mr. McKenzie. Um, I don't have that number. Um, so we will add that to the list of the, we send out a letter afterwards just to say so what were uh, information we were looking for that wasn't able to be pro provided at the meeting. So we will uh, I'll ensure the clerk has uh, sent that to you after the meeting. MLA Coops. Thank you, Chair. That was going to be my next question. Uh, <laughs> You said the staff is going through this. Um, how are they tracking it? Emily McKen uh, sorry, Mr. McKenzie. <laughs> um, how are they tracking the inspect overdue? Uh, it, it, it's populated within our FDM system. Uh, we, uh, they, they're notified of upcoming inspections and what's due. Um, I would like to just point out one thing is that uh, with our system, there is a way that uh, when deputies are entering the data, if they don't do it correctly, it can create a duplicate file. So sometimes that's creating some false data for us and that's what we're cleaning up right now. MLA Coombs. So with the FDM system, would we be able to get that number by the end of this meeting today? Mr. McKenzie? Um, I don't believe we could, I can have staff reach out and try. I can't, com I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not, I don't run the system. We have a, a, a staff member that is our statistician and he runs the FDM system and can compile that information. I'm just not sure how quickly it's available. Thank you. Emily Coombs. In your opinion, is the office receiving adequate funding? Mr. McKenzie, nine minutes. Um, again, we've uh, we've agreed to uh, the department has agreed to do a, an uh, an overview of the uh, office and its functions, and I believe that funding and resources is going to be part of that discussion. Emily Coombs. Thank you, and I will remind the deputy minister, <laughs> since he is here, and in fact, in 2021, the budgeted amount was cut significantly, and that amounts in the years prior had been relatively stagnant. So I would say that probably not adequately funded. Um, has the office asked for additional funding over this period? Sorry, repeat. Has the office asked for additional funding during this period? Sorry, I'm still in a state of shock and crisis. We, somebody cut Is the budget. Uh, Deputy, Deputy LaFleche. Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm trying to figure out this budget cut thing. I think is, is, is uh, uh, I'd have to check with, uh, is that because we ran the volunteer fire department grants? So it wasn't cut at all. We ran the fire department 10, so we provided in the last two years consecutively $10,000 to volunteer fire departments and ground search and rescue. I think in the first year it was run through our budget. In the second year it was run through the department budget. Yeah, uh, so it was just run a different way. So there was no cut uh, at all. Uh, that's just a, an accounting transaction. And uh, you know, if anybody needs to see that, we can we can walk you. You, I'm not talking to you. I, I'm answering your question, but I'm talking to the people who are supposed to be in back of me. But I, I don't think they're there today. Um, they did come and see us yesterday and say they were coming with a lot of questions today. So I don't know where they are. But uh, if they want to uh, run through the numbers, they'll see there's been no uh, dramatic cut. Uh, in fact, there's been a huge increase, which was uh, the amount that you're speculating might have been cut, was a huge increase. What's that? So, um, so uh, just if we can Sorry, just uh, cut down on the cross talk there. Um, so, so I will uh, uh, over to uh, MLA Coombs. Then, yes, then I'd ask the Deputy Minister to please send us um, the budgets over the past five years regarding the department. Um, with the time, how did the funding or staff levels change when this office was moved um, from the former Department of Labor to ad an advanced education? Um, De <coughs> Deputy LaFleche. Well, uh, I, I wish I had the, the guy who stole my tie, uh, he would know some of that because um, he was the minister, uh, but I have no idea. Uh, no, I, I was will the find minister. 
You were the minister. Yeah. Okay. Can you answer the question for no. me? <laughs> no. That was that was like uh, ten years ago. <laughs> yeah. Nine we'll or ten uh, years we'll find ago. A, yeah. what we'll do is we'll get a perspective of the budgets. But I, I think the important thing is here is that uh, there's two different things being talked about in terms of resources and staffing. And I appreciate it's, it's, it, it might be a little difficult to separate them out. One is, uh, like with building inspectors, uh, which we don't directly employ, uh, but, uh, but municipalities do, uh, we're having trouble recruiting in the fire marshal area, obviously, and uh, but we employ those directly as well as municipalities, and uh, that's because, as the fire marshal explained, there's only a small uh, pool of uh, of people who are trained to a certain level available. We're going to have to aggressively address that issue of recruitment. In building inspectors, as you know, I've been here before. Uh, we're in fact paying for courses to be put through rapidly. Uh, to train building inspectors. We're breaking down the infamous Ontario, Quebec, uh, Alberta barrier where we couldn't get uh, somehow certified despite long careers. All of those things are being done. You've heard the Premier speak about the, the professions and how the government is moving forward with breaking the barriers down. So we'll solve that problem. We've got a similar problem here on availability of, 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 of uh, people that we can recruit from. So that's one issue. So we have the, the money, the position, but we don't have a great pool of people to hire from so we're working on that and we're going to have to look at ways we can we can uh, improve that uh, availability some of it will of course involve equity and diversity uh, initiatives etc the Thank second you. thing uh, so I know she wants a question yes, but the second does. thing I'm pointing out is going forward do we have enough resources that's the question okay that's under review as suggested by the Auditor General I'm going to the, there's a Deputy Ministers of Building Code, believe it or not, meeting Friday, and all the national Deputy Ministers responsible for Building Code meet. The Building Code changes every three or so years. And Deputy LaFleche, yeah. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm getting the side eye from MLA Coombs, <laughs> rightfully so, because uh, she wants to ask another question. MLA Coombs, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, and that wasn't my aunt, a question, but okay. So in... Recommendation 1.4, the department has set a target date of this month. Can you provide an update on the progress and can you, and can you table the updated inspection policy? Uh, Mr. McKenzie? <coughs> sorry. Um, sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Somebody was whispering in my ear. Um, on, on your other question, we are trying to pull together the numbers for you. We should be able to have it today. It may not be a fully accurate number because we haven't done our cleanup yet. So just point of order. Um, uh, the uh, inspection policy in that will be tabled today. Um, I'm sorry I missed your first part of your question. MLA Coombs? Uh, recommendation 1.4. The department um, set a target date of this month. What's the progress on that? Mr. McKenzie. Uh, the uh, inspection policy has been updated. The uh, triplicate form has been uh, reinstituted, and uh, we are complete on that. Uh, we are just waiting for uh, everything to be entered into TAGR so we can move that up as an approved item. MLA Coombs. Thank you. Um, the AG reported, I don't, as we discussed, the four public housing buildings uh, missing. <clears throat> from the office internal uh, list uh, based on a small sample that was provided. Has the office audited the entire list to ensure that no others are missing? Mr. McKenzie. Yes, yeah, so we've received lists from our partners in government, uh, all the agencies, and we're we're, we did a pro project last summer with a summer student where she compiled the list and made sure that it, uh, the buildings were matching up. And uh, as we move forward with the uh, MOU with uh, Halifax Fire, we're going to be having some meetings and, and discussing, uh, making sure that there are no buildings and clarifying uh, each other's roles so that there's nothing missed in the future. Emily Coombs, just over two minutes. Does that um, include the Provincial Housing Authority reviewing their, their list? Mr. McKenzie. Yes, the Provincial Housing Group has provided us with an up-to-date list. Uh, they have in the past, and we just keep, it's part of our yearly process. Emily Coombs. The, um, the building that um, this department was in charge of looking after, because you mentioned three were HRM. Uh, what was the age of that building? <clears throat> Mr. McKenzie. 
I, I would have to go back and, and get that information. I wouldn't have that today. Emily Coombs? Was it never included on the list, or had it fallen off? Mr. McKenzie. Uh, it wasn't on our list. Um, I can't say whether or not it was on Halifax's list or not. Um, it, it's not on their current list. Review, Paul. Um, can you provide an update on this? <clears throat> Mr. McKenzie. Uh, that recommendation is complete and we'll be tabling the documents today. <clears throat> Emily Coombs. Thank you, and I probably have not too long, not long, so. Um, yeah, 45 seconds. 45 seconds, oh, wow, okay. Uh, what, was the, uh, what was the reason that no annual reports were filed with the department for a four-year period? And did the department request these re reports at any point? Mr. McKenzie. The, uh, the reports were generated. Uh, during that period, we went through a, a, a change in government. Uh, I believe we went through three ministers and four deputies. Uh, so the documents had to be updated before they could be submitted. Um, they are all submitted now. Uh, and the current year uh, is, uh, I've uh, submitted that to, uh, to our, our we're, we're in the final stages. I'm, I'm about to submit it, I should say. I shouldn't have said I submitted it. I'm getting it uh, proofread right now. And then Order. we'll be submitting. Order. Time for NDP questioning has lapsed. We'll now move on to the PC caucus. And we'll begin with Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. And since actually it was a question I was going to ask, I will um, let Mr. McKenzie finish if there's anything, because he tried to rush out the question to my colleague across the table. Mr. McKenzie. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so all the all the reports are have been submitted and are up to date. Um, and the current year for uh, last fiscal, uh, which we I had set a personal target of having it completed by end of June. Staff have, have been able to compile the information, and I plan on hopefully submitting that to the minister within the next two weeks. Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to comment also on the budget that was the Auditor General gave us. It was actually 17, 18, the budget was 2.4 million, and eight, all four years after that, it was 2.5 million. So there wasn't a decrease from at least the Auditor General's view. Um, and this will be to um, Mr. McKenzie, which will be, the Auditor General's job is, is to check policy versus what's getting done. Very clearly, you made a change in check policy. So, you know, 10 years volunteer fire service, policy's policy. There, there, so the point that it was changed, she found an error. You guys have actually gone back to it, which is good, but I, I, I don't see where, like w when it came in, if the, doc, if the policy says that and it's not there, I hate to tell you, I agree with the Auditor General. It's a zero compliance. Because if a volunteer fire service doesn't fill out their paperwork, uh, even they decide they don't need it, your department will say you're zero compliance because you don't have it. So um, I just want to make that comment before I uh, get into my questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the uh, Auditor General discussed about human resources challenges. Um, given the target of the Office of the Fire Marshal to address these issues within the year, what are the steps being done to ensure they receive this during the deadline that the Office of the Fire Marshal gave the Auditor General? Mr. McKenzie. I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that? Mr. McTall. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm trying to remember to pause till you say it. Um, <laughs> okay, given the target that the Office of the Fire Marshal to address the issues of human resources challenges within the year, what are the first steps the office will be taking to ensure they, they achieve this deadline? Mr. McKenzie. Yeah. Um, again, the department committed to uh, a review of the office and we will be working with uh, senior management on, on that review and working towards uh, any, any changes that need to be done. Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and um, so, one thing that I, I just have to say is 
these deficiencies haven't been here in the last three years, which we had COVID. These are issues that have been raised for a while. So I just, I disagree with where I'm, I hear, well, it's COVID and this is where it was, because they've been here for a while. Like previous auditor generals have done that. They've shown this. So um, I'm gonna ask one more question and let it go to my other colleagues, but just say like, the everyone should realize that I'm expecting the committee is gonna want you guys back before the auditor general does the review to see how all of these all of these things they've committed to are being done and all the stuff because fire safety is a big deal. So, um, okay, so the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the Office of the Fire Marshal have committed to review of the Office of the Fire Marshal, which you've raised. What methods do you intend to use to determine the office's current ability to realize these goals set for the future? Deputy LaFleche. Well, I'm going to start with that and then I'll pass it over to the fire marshal. Um, as I was, uh, sorry, at great length saying to Mimele Coombs before, things change. The building codes constantly change. Uh, the standards change. Every three years or so, we change building codes. We're now in the 2020. There's going to be a 2025. And that's what I'm going to talk about this week. And, and, and there's new dimensions, new requirements, uh, new things we have to do. It's just like if you're in a municipality, there's new water and sewer uh, regulations coming down from the federal government. So it's, uh, we always have to be up to date and see what our resources might need be going forward. So this review will hopefully not just get us to date, but also anticipate where do we have to go in the future in terms of resources, not just with us, but where, where do the municipalities have to be is a greater responsibility. So we will be looking at all of that um, as we go forward. Now, what we're exactly going to do in this review, I'll turn it over to the fire marshal. Mr. McKenzie. Thank you, Deputy. <laughs> um, well, obviously, we're going to be looking at the number of inspections that have to be completed, uh, how we're tackling the uh, fire investigation issues. Uh, we do have some problem areas within the province that we want to provide focus on, and uh, we are looking at our training and outreach programs uh, for fire safety. So that's all going to be looked at and uh, identified for what resources we would need to do along with the uh, new builds within the province. Uh, and, and I've uh, received information from Mr. McDonald that we'll now move on to MLA Sheehy Richard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, uh, welcome. This is a really important topic. And I have a husband who is a veteran firefighter at 23 years and a father-in-law who was a fire inspector municipally. Um, who has uh, combined 52 years of service and also was captain in the Dartmouth Fire Department. So he only, you know, this stuff is really important to me. So I, I, I'm kind of trying to understand, you know, the extensive paperwork I know that needs to be done in inspections um, that is required when responding to a fire. Uh, given the gaps identified in the fire incident reporting, can you explain how documentation from local departments is currently being utilized uh, within the office of the fire marshal within your office? Mr. McKenzie. Thank you. And uh, thank your family for their service, please. Um, the, uh, the information that we gather from the Municipal Fire Service uh, goes into our database uh, as, as well as our investigation component, and that is used to develop the statistics that we publish in the yearly uh, uh, Fire Marshal's annual report. Uh, we've also partnered with uh, uh, um, StatsCan and the Canadian Commission of uh, Fire Marshal Fire Commissioners on a national fire incident database. So we're looking at uh, fire trends uh, across the nation as well as locally, and that shapes the programming that we're going to be providing in the, in the future. Uh, we've had an issue. Uh, the online reporting system for the fire marshal's office just came, came on board a few years ago. That was part of our upgrade. Uh, before that, uh, we had to manually enter, staff had to manually enter the information. So now we're all digital on that end, and we can pull those statistics better. Uh, not all fire service in the province are reporting as per the legislation, and we're working with those folks to get that, and we're getting better numbers all the time. Uh, we did make a requirement uh, for the emergency provider service provider fund, the ESPF fund, that anyone qualifying for it has to be current as of January 1, 2022. So departments this year are having to backdate their information for us. So 
this time next year, we'll be able to pull some real-time, realistic data and get a better idea of what we're at. And we're up over 10,000 incidents uh, just in the last little while uh, over last year. Emily Sheehy Richard. Um, and then uh, the AG has raised concerns also with your operating system, and I know we talked about it somewhat, but it's very confusing because do you have the system? Are you putting in the new system? Or what are these systems? So can you describe how your current system is going to be better equipped to handle the needs of the office compared to this prior version? Please. Mr. McKenzie. Thank you. Uh, so our current system, um, we use that for all of our fire inspections, um, metals, training, all that information is captured in there. It currently can't support our fire investigation uh, process, so we have a separate uh, method of dealing with that. The new system will combine, uh, you know, our hopes is, as we look for, to the future, is we'll combine all that information together. It'll also allow us to continue to bring the online reporting from the fire departments and the insurance industry into the system. Um, again, um, uh, Nova Scotia has a uh, security uh, concern around outside providers bringing information in, so we have to be cognizant of that. Emily Sheehy Richard. Ten Th minutes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, in, what was the timeline that you set, and do you feel optimistic that you're going to be able to reach that timeline? Mr. McKenzie. Um, we set a timeline for the new system for the end of fiscal 26-27. Um, we hope to have it before then. Again, that'll be part of the review that the office is going to go undergo. Uh, and again, there's a, a, I'm not the technical person. I, I, I don't have my technical people here. Uh, but they will have to do the uh, data transfer and the security checks. So that'll all be through uh, Service Nova Scotia. MLA Sheehy Richard. And then in the meantime, you're going to go back to the triplicate form so that I have this all straight. Mr. McKenzie. Uh, the triplicate form is in, in play. It is going to stay in play, and it will be the bane of my existence. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Sheehy Richard. Well, thank you. That is good to hear. And I will pass it on to my colleague, uh, Emily Young. Emily Young. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question around the uh, around the documentation again. I know we did bits and pieces, and there's there's pieces of the puzzle coming together. But the Auditor General reports multiple failures in documentation within the Office of the Fire Marshal. Is it the position of the Office of the Fire Marshal that this is this framing of the record keeping is accurate, or if not, which I think I'm hearing, can you explain? Just could you explain the process? Um, that you're using to document your responsibilities and why they were not included in the AG report. Mr. McKenzie. So the current system doesn't allow for uh, any of the auditing that we do. Uh, so the assistant fire marshal and myself audit the, the tasks of the, of the staff. So when we go in and review a, a file, there's no timestamp or no documentation and no way to trigger anything. So there's no documentation to show that. That is, that is some of the oversight that the Auditor General wants to be able to see and qualify. We have been doing it, but it's not documented. The, the, the hope is the new, the new systems that we've been looking at have those features and we'll be able to provide that in the future should the AG want that. Uh, Mr. Young. And that would include um, inspectors lists and pending inspections, completed inspections and all that criteria? Mr. McKenzie. Yes, that would be correct. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Young? Yeah. Um, can you share what is the Office of the Fire Marshal's plan to ensure the generational health care builds currently happening within the province are inspected and up to code? Mr. McKenzie. So we've, uh, we have a uh, plans examina uh, examiner uh, and fire code coordinator and a building code coordinator. Uh, we've pivoted one of our deputies over onto a special projects for the healthcare builds who has a strong background in construction and fire uh, and code. He's a certified building official fire inspector. So we're pivoting his resources to a special projects to um, oversee the uh, healthcare builds. Mr. Young. So 
The period that the Office of the Auditor General audit covers is during the COVID-19 pandemic. In what ways did the pandemic affect the OFM's ability to conduct these activities? Mr. McKenzie. Um, so it, it limited some of the uh, buildings that we could actually physically inspect. Uh, it caused us to uh, adapt and find new ways of com confirming compliance. Uh, so sometimes uh, staff would be discussing things with, uh, with the building maintenance people and that may not have been entered into our data system as an inspection, but they were uh, daily speaking with folks. Um, there was some limitations around some travel. Um, and at one point during the pandemic, we actually had hired a, a deputy fire marshal from Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, I believe it was, who came on a term and drove down through the pandemic. So uh, he was on a term, he ended up leaving early, uh, but it was, it was a good six months with him. Uh, we also did things, uh, we, we were tasked with other unique things, such as, uh, you know, changes in a, in, a, in a nursing home where they wanted to prepare an isolation ward. They wanted to make sure that they were compliant with the fire regulations, so we'd be talking with staff on that. Uh, to the fact that we were dealing with fire departments that uh, as per the uh, National Fire Protection Agency requirement of a new fire truck, it has to be del delivered, it has to be driven from the manufacturer to the to the destination, they can't ship it. So the borders were closed. So we had to have a uh, coordination with everybody to do a handoff at the border. So uh, there was a number of unique situations that came up. Um, you know, the Office of the Fire Marshal tends to catch the, the stuff that nobody else can deal with from time to time, and uh, that presents some challenges too. So COVID was a, a learning experience. Um, I was acting fire marshal for uh, the, a major part of it, and uh, it was a challenge. Mr. Young, five minutes. I will pass it to my colleague, MLA Taggart. MLA Taggart. Uh, thanks, Chair. I just, uh, I, I uh, kind of, so I, I so, <laughs> Uh, Mr. McKenzie, I, 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 um, I want to say how much I respect your office, Volunteer Fire Service. I have 25 years myself, uh, 13 Volunteer Fire Brigades in my, in my uh, uh, district, uh, and, I, and they're the backbone of our communities. But I have to ask this question. In 2021, and it may have been asked in some form before, but we've been all over the place here. In 2021, the annual report the Office of the Fire Marshal stated that from within the Department of DMAH uh, and through other branches of government, the Office of the Fire Marshal is well supported with regards to information technology. And that seems to be where we're falling down right now, uh, in my view, uh, you know, uh, whether the auditor, you know, we're, you know, the, the, you know, the auditor wanted this, you guys were doing that, whatever. And then, you know, I think I've heard that, uh, you know, you put in a new system when you get rid of the triplicate one, but then that, 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 that's not compatible with uh, what the current uh, volunteer fire brigades are putting in. So will you clarify that for me? So in 2021, whether it was you, and I understand you were acting, and I understand these are long-term challenges. This has not happened, uh, you know, today. But I just, uh, you know, in 2021, somebody did a report that said that this information technology was under control. And that, I believe, is our challenge right now. It's communications. Thanks. Could you give us a little information on that? Mr. McKenzie. Um, so the, the system is the same system. We've had the same system since the early 90s. There's been some upgrades done to it. We're, we're looking to the future to a new system. Um, most majorly, well, the auditor, based on the Auditor General's recommendations, as well as being notified by the supplier that it's gonna be going on its end of life. So we, we still have the same system. Um, the system was supposed to be, uh, the upgrade was supposed to be able to support us doing uh, inspections remotely on, a, on an app that didn't pan out, and that's where the confusion relates to the paper copy of the record of inspection. Um, so, like I say, we, we did away with it, we, but we brought it back. Um, the, uh, as far as being adequately supported, we are adequately supported for that system. Uh, we have the, the staff, at, at, uh, my staff and his counterparts uh, support the system and do any corrections or, or fixes that we need. Mr. Taggart? Thank you. Uh, um, so I guess I, I, uh, 
Um, so I spent 12 years in municipal government, and uh, so, uh, um, you know they have their own fire inspector, and there's a, you know they do one thing, you do the other. Uh, but the AG report notes a lack of oversight from the office, office of fire Mar marshals on the matter of municipally managed inspections. Is there a difference in the training required to conduct municipal inspections compared to those conducted by your office? Uh, and, uh, and and you might, I don't know, it's, uh, tie that into the, where the Canadian Building Code, you know, fits with respect to uh, fire safety. Uh, and if so, are there ways that a lack of qualified personnel may be contributing to the volume of uninspected sites? Now, I, I understand. Uh, the difference between, you know, the municipal, but, but can you speak to that for a little bit for me? Uh, Mr. McKenzie, 45 seconds. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so <laughs> under the uh, Fire Safety Act, uh, the municipal inspector and our deputies have the same powers, and they also uh, have the same requirements for training. Um, the, uh, the training can be from a number of uh, key uh, uh, training suppliers. NFPA has training, uh, the, the Fire Inspectors Association Nova Scotia provides training to municipal inspectors and, and deputy fire marshals. So uh, they all have the same qualifications. Uh, our deputies do have some extra qualifications when it comes to fire investigation, which is the key thing there. Um, but uh, currently under the legislation, there's no requirement for any certification as a fire inspector, whereas a building official does have that under the Building Code Act. Order. Thank you. Uh, nicely done, Mr. McKenzie. You finished uh, one second over. Uh, we will now move on to uh, our second round of questioning. Each caucus will have 10 minutes. Uh, we'll begin first again with the Liberal Caucus, Emily McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, respectfully, there's been some softball down the middle questions asked here in this committee. Uh, you know, I'm not a great baseball player, but even though I could have hit some of these out of the park. So uh, we do have some legit concerns from the Auditor General. And those concerns, whether the public knows it or not, directly impacts them. Fire inspection and the Office of the Fire Marshal, while it goes unnoticed until it's needed, is extremely important. Um, so uh, the real crux of the uh, of this meeting is the Auditor General, in her words, and I, I'm not going to say word for word, said that this was one of the probably most troubling um, reports she has ever done in her career, and that says something because you know she's she's done a fair amount of reports. Um, so the so the question is, um, when will these be these legislative uh, mandated fire inspections be done? Done on time, done with information for the public to see. Um, we need a time frame on this, and we need assurance from this department that. This won't happen again, even though there's a history of it falling behind. Deputy LaFleche. So uh, the MLA is quite correct. There's a long history here. It dates back to the first one report in 2011. The Auditor General is quite rightly frustrated that we have not, since 2011, displayed multiple opportunities and in between reports. It seems that some of the original 2011 recommendations. Uh, were, were not uh, followed up to the extent uh, that they should have been. Uh, we all know that, I think. Uh, so we've got an accumulation of a long history here. Um, I could tell you that, you know, as the deputy of today, that I'm going to fix it all. But uh, I think there's been the deputies of previous deputies sitting here saying the same thing with previous ministers saying the same thing. So uh, all I can say is that uh, Minister Lohr is committed to ensuring that this office has the resources it needs, that we are going to get the software we need. And uh, of course, uh, we're not the first uh, department uh, in government that's seeing a software problem. In fact, uh, that's probably the norm of all software purchases. We do have a new digital service with new leadership. And uh, as was uh, mentioned by the uh, the fire marshal, uh, we may have to look at, uh, uh, you know, some sort of a service 
that's specially built as we're looking in other areas because maybe off the shelf stuff is not what we need anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We're going to look at that. Um, but we're going to get uh, the IT upgraded. We're going to make sure the resources are where they need to be after we do our review. And uh, we're going to have to look at, as I said earlier, the whole system around where do we get fire marshals, how were they trained, how do they go through the pipeline so we can have adequate resources so when we do have the right number of positions. We think we have the right number now, but uh, you know who knows where we're going to be in five years. This is a moving target. So I'd love to give you the guarantee that everything's going to be great, and then you'll have a new deputy here in three years. I see there was a 26 uh, uh, up on the screen that the fire marshal mentioned. Um, I hope I'm here in 26. Uh, you never know, though. Uh, but we're going to do all we can to, to get there, OK? Uh, MLA McGuire, six minutes. Again, I, respectfully, I, I appreciate the answer. And, and again, like I'm not, uh, again, you know, I'm not sitting here pointing partisan fingers on this stuff. What I'm saying is that this is extremely important, and this can be a matter of life and death. It really can. And the public and the Auditor General needs insurance, assurance that this is going to be done. It's going to be done when it is legislated, le legislatively mandated to be done, which has not been happening. The department is behind. When? Can we get a? We need a time frame here today on when the department will catch up on those inspections, and when we can see going forward these inspections being done when they're legislated to be done. So, Deputy Lafleche. So, I think we've got to separate the two things: the the inspections themselves being done, which they are being done. There's a few who are late. We did have the COVID period. We're not blaming everything on that, but there there is not a massive backlog of inspections that are not being done. We are working on the generational health bills, as was asked earlier. We have a person dedicated to that. So we feel very confident that in terms of the actual inspections, we're going to be able to achieve that going forward. The time frame? Well, we're hopefully we're, we're there today, OK? Hopefully we're going to uh, be there and, and get things done. There are certain things that slip through the cracks. As you know, we're also responsible for public housing, and uh, we've, we've now got uh, uh, a list of the right buildings, same with seniors in long-term care, same with the health buildings. So all of those lists are being compiled, and we'll know which buildings, and maybe nothing will slip through the cracks. There's always the question of municipal versus provincial. We're sorting that out with the municipality. Um, so in terms of the safety of the public and the actual inspections, Okay, that's not what we're worried about. We feel going forward from today, we're, we're good and the public can feel confident and safe, including in the buildings you mentioned and, and Mr. Young mentioned earlier. Uh, so the paperwork, Emily that's McGuire? a different issue. Okay. Emily McGuire? I only have a few minutes, so I just want to get to a few things. Quickly, you, you said there was a backlog. What is the backlog? Just, we need a quick answer. What is the backlog of units that have not been inspected as of today? Deputy LaFleche. Pass it to the fire marshal. To Mr. McKenzie. As uh, MLA Coombs asked that question earlier, we're, we're gathering that information for you. We'll have it for you hopefully today. MLA I, McGuire. I, Sorry. Mr. McKenzie, were you, uh, you have something else? Yeah, if I could just say uh, our friends at uh, Long Term Care and Health had, uh, had a discussion with us yesterday. They did a scan of any short term licenses that they issue. They only issue those when there's, there's a problem. Uh, of the, uh, of the, they only issued nine in 2022 23 uh, because uh, they, the uh, facility was working on recommendations from our office. Uh, of the nine that they had those short term licenses on, only one were we late in inspecting, and we were late by two days. Emily McGuire. To, to the deputy, are you confident? of the 1,300 units that your department is in charge of inspecting, are you confident here today that they are all safe when it comes to uh, inspections from the fire marshal's office? Can you confidently say that? Deputy LaFleche. Uh, obviously, I don't do the inspections myself, so you're putting me on the spot. Um, but I'm confident that the office of the fire marshal is uh, completing those inspections as required and the public can feel they are safe, as safe as one can be, given the inspection regime. 
Do you want to comment on that? Mr. McKenzie? Um, a key thing to remember is the majority of these type of uh, buildings have additional fire and life safety systems built in, and, it, and they're being maintained by the operational staff. So that raises the level of safety within those structures automatically. Emily McGuire. When there are issues are identified in these, say, public housing units, for example, how quickly is the, uh, are the finances released to the department to deal with these deficiencies in your 1,300 units? So let's say tomorrow you find uh, it's going to be $5 million worth of upgrades that need to be done. How quickly is that turnover uh, from failing to passing from not, not safe to safety? Deputy LaFleche. Uh, as I think we said last time we were here, we, the government has allocated a significant uh, an historic amount of uh, tangible capital asset and operating money to maintenance and repair for the first time in decades. So I'm going back decades, so you don't have to worry that's you. <laughs> um, uh, decades to uh, public housing to do those repairs. So right now we have, we have the adequate capital resources to do that. And uh, it's been a long time, and I think if Mr. Ward were here, who's in charge of the, the executive director, he could tell you how happy he was because uh, we haven't had those resources to come in. So we, yes, we can do that. Emily McGuire, two seconds. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll now move on to the uh, NDP caucus for questioning uh, MLA LeBlanc. Thank you very much, and um, I apologize for my lateness, so I didn't uh, get to hear all the introductions. And so I may ask a couple of things that have already been asked. I apologize for that. Um, I just want to know, we've heard several times now that there are overdue inspections, and we will get the number of how many soon. I'm, I'd like to know, um, when, so we have in the Auditor General's report, there is uh, on page 18, there is this beautiful chart about <coughs> How um, how many days over there uh, there were uh, or there were several inspections that were this many days over? You know we're talking about daycares, seniors homes, group homes, uh, in some in one case a, a hospital facility I believe. When those overdue inspections were completed, did were there um, was there evidence of more work needed to bring things up to safety codes? Or, um, or you know, was it just sort of as per usual, like you know, a fire extinguisher had to be replaced or whatever? Mr. McKenzie. Yeah. Uh, of the 12 long-term care facilities that were mentioned in the report, uh, none required in order to take action. Uh, half had a, uh, a a letter for housekeeping items to be taken care of, and the rest passed. Emily LeBlanc. Thanks. And can you also tell me when, when the provincial fire marshal office goes in to do an inspection of a provincial building, uh, are you only looking at the fire and health safety systems like the sprinklers and, and the fire safety or are you also looking at like wiring for instance or um, you know windows that open and don't open, that kind of thing? Mr. McKenzie? So a fire inspection would encompass anything that relates to fire and life safety. So blocked exits, um, heaters under desks in an office space, uh, improper storage of chemicals or refuse, uh, block, uh, I said blocked exits, um, making sure that the f sprinkler system, fire alarm systems are up to date, properly tested. Uh, there's a yearly, there's a requirement for those to be tested yearly by an independent third party. That the monthly, weekly, and daily checks that the building staff are responsible for are being completed. It's also an opportunity for our staff to educate the uh, maintenance staff on their roles and responsibilities and answer any questions that they may have. So a deputy may spend an hour in a building uh, doing the inspection and he may spend an hour or two with the, uh, with the occupants uh, educating them as well. MLA LeBlanc. Thank you for that. And, and for those um, places that you do have to do follow-up or that there's an action required, 
Uh, how uh, in, in is there a time frame for follow-up inspections? And we know that in the Auditor General's report there is a, a, an issue with follow-up inspections. So how are those being managed? And how many of those are overdue to make sure I mean, we in Public Accounts Committee understand about follow-up reports and how we have to keep track of things. And we, I think I, I agree with my colleague that we will ask you folks to come back uh, so that we can find out that, you know, that things are progressing. But, um, but in terms of the inspections on the ground, how are you keeping track of that? Mr. McKenzie. So anytime an inspection is completed, if it's a housekeeping item, the deputy may issue a letter to that effect and give them a set timeline. And that can be any, that, that is at their preference. Um, if an order to take action is issued, uh, they can set the timeline as, again, generally it's a 30 day order uh, to give people time to do things. Some things can be done immediately. Uh, we, can, we give verbal orders and we uh, also ask for things to be completed immediately on site as well. Uh, the follow-up orders, uh, so the 30 days later inspection, that would be captured in the overdue inspection number if, if we weren't compliant. Uh, the onus, though, is on the building owner when an order is issued. They are legal res legally responsible to comply with that order within the 30 days. We don't have to go back and inspect. The, the owner should have that work done, and if they don't, we are able to charge them at that point. So we don't have to go back and inspect, but we generally do. Emily LeBlanc, six minutes. But how would you know if they did, if you don't go back and inspect, how do you know if they've completed it? Mr. McKenzie. Yeah, we do do the follow-up inspections. It may not be on the day 30, it may be 45 days later, it may be something that the deputy just needs to pop in, have a quick look at, and he'll fit it into his schedule, his or her schedule, when it suits uh, their their daily work. MLA LeBlanc. Okay, thanks. So, um, one of the issues that the AG brought up is that there um, there's supposed to be meetings between uh, municipal affairs and. Um, and the Office of the Fire Marshal, a bi-weekly bi sort of check-in meetings. But the only evidence of the meetings they could find were like um, Outlook calendar, uh, <laughs> you know, you know those Outlook calendar invitation things. Um, so are, did those meetings happen? Are, are those meetings happening every two weeks the way they're supposed to? Uh, and if so, where is the evidence of those meetings aside from the calendar invites? Mr. Mason. <laughs> yeah, there's no requirement. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's really a management practice that I have. So basically, I, of course, oversee the Office of the Fire Marshal along with the Emergency Management Office. So as a practice, I meet bi-weekly with my directors. Uh, so I had bi-weekly meetings set up with, uh, with the Fire Marshal. Really, the intent of those meetings uh, is really just to kind of touch base on regular bu business. They're not a, a formal staff meeting with agenda and minutes and so on and so forth. It's really just to kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, make sure that various initiatives and what have you are moving forward. So that's why there wasn't more documentation beyond that. Uh, when I met with the Auditor General's office uh, towards the end of this process, they did ask about my engagement with the Office of the Fire Marshal, at which point I noted that I have regular bi-weekly meetings with the Fire Marshal uh, to uh, discuss those issues and as evidence I produce those. So that's why there's not an agenda in minutes. They're, they're not formalized to the level of a, a staff meeting. They're really a, a bi-weekly touch base. Emily LeBlanc, I, I see Ms., uh, Mr. LaFleche, but Emily LeBlanc has indicated she wishes to speak. She has three minutes. Yeah, I don't have much time. Thank you. Um, so don't tell anyone, but in my calendar every week, there's canvassing. <laughs> I just go knocking on doors every single week. And let me tell you, folks, it doesn't happen. <laughs> I, I often <laughs> skip my canvassing. <laughs> don't tell anyone. Uh, but um, no, but it's like a, it's a regular thing, and it's in my calendar, and sometimes it gets done, sometimes it gets, not to say that I'm not c calling your thing into question, but I'm wondering, therefore, since you don't have evidence of those meetings or, or you know, official agendas or notes, how many meetings a year, say, do you have where there's an official agenda and notes and minutes and all of that stuff? Mr. Mr. Mason? 
Sorry. With the minutes, and first of all, I'd like to state we do have those biweekly meetings. Like in a, in a year, there's be 26 of those. There may be one or two that get canceled because of holidays and what have you, but Doug and I do have those meetings on a regular basis. With regard to the minutes where there's agendas and, and or meetings with agendas and minutes and so on and so forth, those would be larger meetings that the department has with, with all of our management team and what have you, the more formalized meetings per se. Emily LeBlanc. And how often do those happen a year? Mr. Mason. Sure. Generally once a month. Emily LeBlanc. Uh, great. And then in terms of, um, you know, not having enough people to, to be, look, we've got a staffing shortage. Can, can we, is there anything you can look at right now in terms of what that reason is? Is it wages? Is it type of work? Are there exit interviews being done when people leave? Do we know the reasons why there's a, sh a staffing shortage? We know why there's shortages in nursing and <laughs> in doctors and, and paramedics. We know all that. Do we know this reason? Mr. McKenzie. Um, there's a there's a number of reasons for the staffing shortages. Uh, some of it is retirement. Uh, there's some other other issues at play that we uh, that we're dealing with. Um, but uh, it's it's a small group of individuals, and it's it's a technical group. Um, we're we're recruiting nationally and internationally. We're interviewing across Canada, um, and we're uh, we're trying to bring people here. MLA LeBlanc, one minute. Love to hear more about the t the issues that you're dealing with. So, like, wh you know, this is the public accounts committee. We we need to know because the thing is, is that if these reports are, or if these inspections are not being done because of staff shortages, we need to know what the issues are with staff shortages. So, if you could expand on that, that would be great. Mr. McKenzie, um, some of, some of the staff shortages are due to HR issues, um, so I can't get into that. Uh, as I said, we've had some retirements, we've had some illnesses, so uh, some of the shortages may not be that uh, that we don't have people, it's just they're not in the workplace. Uh, we've had uh, some uh, staff off with medical procedures, things of that nature. Uh, Ms. LeBlanc. Deputy LaFleche, um, when can we see the upgraded building code happen in Nova Scotia? So the 2020 build, building code, when will that be implemented and will there be um, changes to the building code to uh, recognize efficiency in buildings? One second. Mr. LaFleche. Okay. Order, order. Time we'll for NDP later. questioning has elapsed. No, no, no. We'll now move on to PC caucus, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one uh, quick question. Uh, it was noted in the AG report that there was a conflict of interest. Uh, so I'm just curious if we can discuss that for a second and find out why that wasn't disclosed properly and what we've done since the report to address the issue. Mr. McKenzie. Well, I... Mr. LaFleche. I think it's not... Not fair to have Mr. McKenzie answer that okay. because he's the subject of the conflict of interest. So... Uh, so I'll, I'm going to go through a little history. If you want to go to the bathroom, you can. <laughs> um, so in, uh, Mr. McKenzie came on uh, around, I think, 2011 from uh, Cape Breton. Uh, was hired as a, a deputy uh, fire marshal, which is under the assistant, which is under the fire marshal. And uh, at that time, he had been on a board of an organization uh, which deals with, uh, it's a, a fire marshal association, <laughs> which deals with training uh, in the area. And he had been on the board in his Cape Breton job since 05. Uh, there was a person uh, who uh, was the uh, CEO, if I call it that, I may not get the titles right, who was a head of that association uh, since at least 2011. Um, and uh, Mr. McKenzie was on the board, he remained on the board with us, uh, but he was not the fire marshal, nor the, even the assistant fire marshal, he was a deputy, a deputy fire marshal. So um, there was no apparent conflict of interest at the time. Uh, the person had already been hired, Mr. McKenzie did not participate in the hiring, uh, had nothing to do with it, um, and did not even know the person, okay? Uh, uh, really, to any great extent. So um, years passed, Mr. McKenzie worked his way up through uh, hard work and uh, grittiness and so on, and the ability to answer an hour and a half questions of public accounts uh, to the assistant fire marshal, okay? And then he was, uh, the fire marshal left, he became acting fire marshal a couple of years ago, and then a year ago he became fire marshal. So when he became acting fire marshal, he probably should have sent a letter 
uh, in that we provide funding to some extent to this organization through the fire marshal's office. He should have sent a letter uh, to the, oh, got, okay, I thought, do uh, you need this? Uh, he should have sent a letter to, uh, to the uh, conflict commissioner. Uh, I think it was Joe Kennedy at that time, and it still is. And uh, he should have d sort of documented. He had a verbal, and you know I always believe in a letter. Uh, so there's no you know evidence, it, and it came late. So the the real error here was, uh, uh, okay, I, I missed the part where uh, five years ago, and he and this person who heads the organization got together. Okay, I missed that part. So when that happened, when he became acting fire marshal, he should have. Talk, talk to the, the the immediately, which he didn't do right away. He did a little later, and then he should have documented in a letter. It didn't happen. We now, as you know, we've had some other issues at public housing, also of this nature. So we are going through the organization, as every deputy does, and making sure all these things happen. Um, but uh, the public can be assured that there was no malfeasance, and we basically missed the paperwork on this one too. This one only has to be single, not triplicate. Okay, so I don't want to make light of it because we did do a slippage and uh, we'll correct that. But the, the end result is he is living with the person who is the CEO of this organization and he has declared the conflict. All right. And uh, anything else or back yeah, over back to Tom Okay. Uh, Mr. Taggers. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I just want to say, uh, you know, this is a fairly serious uh, <coughs> conversation we're having here. The uh, Auditor General indicated it was very serious and when my honored colleague across the way came back after leaving the room while everybody else asked questions, uh, commented that we were um, asking softball questions. I'm not sure how that you'd be aware having not been in the room. However, I guess you could have watched it on TV. So I don't see any of these as softball questions. And so I guess uh, my question would be, as my colleagues in the room would know, the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and former Minister of Labor and Advanced Education would know, there have been insufficient actions taken to address the previous report spanning decades. And as a result of this current report from the AG asserts that the Office of the Fire Marshal is failing in to adequately protect the public from fire safety risks. What is the current position of the department, and this is to uh, Deputy LaFleche, with respect to the safety of Nova Scotians on this matter? Thank you. De Deputy LaFleche? Yeah. La We're going to ensure the public is protected. That's the commitment of the minister and the government, and we are going to ensure there's adequate resources, uh, and so the public does not have to worry going forward that in terms of the public buildings and in terms of our liaison with municipalities, that they have anything, any reason to be concerned. Do you want to add something to that? Well, I think... Uh, ADM Potty Bunga? Correct, yeah. That's really good. A lot of people struggle with that last name. <laughs> I, um, I pride myself I, on that. <laughs> it, I think it's important to note as well that two of the seven recommendations are already complete. Uh, that's recommendation four and recommendation six, and uh, Mr. McKenzie has documentation of that effect that he is tabling today. And that also we have two recommendations that are almost complete, uh, looking at uh, that process that's been set up to uh, update the, um, the list. And the letter is gonna be going out in May uh, to uh, deputy ministers and other heads of agencies to ensure uh, that the list uh, remains complete. And that we've also, with regard to recommendation seven, we've, conflict, we've contacted the conflict of interest commissioner. We are compliant with the policy. We are, um, the uh, one step left to take there is to look at what boards are, uh, remaining boards. And we are gonna be doing that next month in June. And the other three are underway. And we have instituted a performance review policy. Uh, the office is now in line with the provincial policy when it comes to performance standards. Performance standards have been shared. There is clarity there. And uh, there is uh, a process now in place to follow that provincial uh, policy and targets have been set. And uh, we are also going to be looking and updating our um, policy with uh, the Halifax Regional Fire Department and updating that MOU. So uh, I think it's fair to say that we are taking these recommendations very seriously. There were 21 of the 24 from previous years which were complete and uh, we will remain committed uh, to getting that work done. 
thank you, Ms. Potty Bunga. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Taggart, do you have anything else Sorry, to add? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure who this is to. Uh, I know the deputy wasn't uh, in this position at that time, but the previous minister uh, in 2021 ever indicate his concern to you that the fire marshal's office was not doing his job to any member, anybody that was in that position at that time. Mr. LaFlash. So you're correct. I wasn't there. So what I have to do is refer to either the executive director or the fire marshal, the acting fire marshal themselves. Sure. Basically, uh, you... Mr. Mason. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, the office of the fire marshal began reporting up through me in December of 2019, basically. So that's when I began overseeing uh, at that time the, the previous fire marshal's work. Uh, we were aware and focused on continuing to try to move forward with the outstanding recommendations uh, from the 2011 report. We take the Auditor General's reports extremely seriously. Uh, at that time, and as, as ADM had noticed a moment ago, or mentioned a, no, a moment ago, I should say, uh, 21 of 25 of those recommendations had been implemented, and we are working on the database system that, uh, that the fire marshal has been referencing at numerous points today, uh, continuing to get the sign-offs around privacy and data integrity and what have you, with the intent of being able to utilize it for the inspections, as he noted. Uh, really what intervened with the progress on uh, executing those remaining four outstanding recommendations from the 2011 report uh, was really the, the challenges that came about as a, as a result of COVID-19. As, as our fire marshal noted, that significantly impacted uh, the ability to conduct inspections. The fire marshal's office was very innovative in trying to find ways to conduct uh, inspections under the restraints in place at that time, uh, but that certainly impacted it. Uh, so it was on the radar. Uh, we were trying to move things forward, but events intervene to an extent, uh, and we've seen some of those issues highlighted in this Auditor General's report, which, uh, as we've noted, will certainly be moving ahead uh, as a high-priority project. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Nine seconds there, Mr. Taggart. I take that to mean the Minister never expressed his concern. Order. Thank you very much. Um, the time for questioning has elapsed. Uh, would the Deputy Minister like to make any closing remarks? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for this. This is a very serious uh, item. Um, someone mentioned earlier that the Auditor General may feel this is uh, one of our most serious reports, and we take that uh, we take that to heart. We're doing everything we can to ensure that the public is protected. And I, I do want to ensure that uh, if there was any insinuation here in any of the questions or, or answers that there are public buildings uh, that are not safe, uh, that uh, we, uh, we, we are going to do everything we can immediately to make them safe and the government has the resources. We will be tabling six documents today and uh, the clerk, uh, Kim Langell, will get them. And I've got a list of them, just so you know. The plan review policy, the inspection policy and process for record retention, the fire investigation and file management procedure, uh, the DM, my letter to the conflict commissioner, Joe Kennedy, and the fire marshal's letter to the conflict commissioner. So those will be tabled today and they can be available for the public to see. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Folks, you are now free to uh, go out. Uh, the media will, may want to speak to you, but uh, we would uh, just like to thank you for coming today and for answering questions. And um, thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to committee business. Uh, perhaps we'll just take a, a two-minute recess to let folks leave. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Tom, just so you know.
We will now call the committee back to order. Uh, we have a couple of um, items of correspondence to deal with. The Department of Public Works uh, provided information from the April 12th meeting. And the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development, uh, we had requested information from the October 26th meeting. Is there any discussion on that correspondence? Ms. LeBlanc. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, uh, two co uh, comments for each of those pieces of correspondence. So the first one I'd like to take is the Public Works one. So in that letter that we received, mm -hmm. um, there were something like 100 public buildings identified as possible sites for, um, for small-scale wood heat. But the letter says that the Natural Resources and Renewables Wood Heat Initiative is on hold pending allocation of capital. Uh, so that's disappointing to hear. It, not, it's not clear, you know, exactly what's going on there, but it's disappointing because this was a program that was identified in the Leahy report, uh, and it's part of the forest transition um, process. Uh, so I am wondering. I would like to make a motion uh, that the that the Public Accounts Committee write a letter to Department of Natural Resources and Renewable asking for a timeline of when the pilot will continue. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none. Um, Just hang on here. What was the motion? Well, well you know, I, I'm, I'm, I was waiting. <laughs> so um, the motion was that the Public Accounts Committee write a letter to the Department of um, Natural Sorry. Natural Resources. Natural Resources uh, asking when the for a, a time for a timeline uh, of this particular program for the continuation of the pilot the continuation of the pilot on the um, wood heat system installation pilot any discussion we take a two minute recess uh, yes the committee the the committee will go it no the, look they they get you know We'll go into recess for two minutes. Uh, we are now recessed at 45. Not uh, the Department of uh, Natural, Resources. Natural Resources, but in fact Public Works, uh, that it, it would be. Um, so any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Contrary-minded nay. The motion is carried. 
Uh, we also have a letter uh, which I believe Ms. LeBlanc would like to speak to about education. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. I just wanted to express our disappointment in the letter um, that the department uh, won't be introducing a school food program without federal funding and direction. That's all. I don't want to make a motion. I just want to express our disappointment. The NDP Cox's disappointment. And that took so long. Uh, thank you, Ms. And LeBlanc. that it took so long to get the letter back. Thank you. Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Ms. LeBlanc. Any further discussion on this particular letter? All right, so um, May 10th, committee decisions. At the May 10th uh, meeting in camera, several decisions were made relative to the committee's upcoming meeting schedule. It was agreed to, at that time to make those decisions public. So for the record, the following decisions were made. It was agreed the Auditor General's Office host an informal meeting with committee members on May 24th. Breakfast would be served at 8.30 and discussion would occur from 9.30, 9 to 11 a.m. and the meeting subject is a discussion with the Office of the Auditor General on the Public Accounts Committee trial process, which is underway from January to May of 2023 and the path forward. And then on May 31st, the committee will meet in camera to then discuss formally how it would like to proceed. And the other motion was that the meeting not be scheduled on Wednesday the 28th, our final meeting of sort of the season, but Friday, June 23rd. Um, it was moved by uh, Mr. Young and the motion was carried and that's because of uh, high school graduation. So we're just going to meet on, on the Friday instead of uh, the following Wednesday. Uh, and as well, today we need to deal with endorsement of the Auditor General recommendations. The 2023 report of the Auditor General Fire, Provincial Fire Safety Management Office of the Fire Marshal. Uh, the committee's practice is to endorse the recommendations made by the Auditor General that have been accepted by departments. I'll now open the floor for discussion. Ms. Coombs. Thank you, and to make this formal, um, I move that the Public Accounts Committee formally accept and endorse the recommendations contained in the 2023 report of the Auditor General Provincial Fire Safety Management Office of the Fire Marshal that have been accepted by the audit, audited departments or agencies and ask that those departments and agencies commit to and take responsibility for full and timely implementation of the recommendations accepted by those departments and agencies. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. Um, we do, uh, members have been provided with the record of decision from the May 3rd subcommittee meeting. Time ran out with the May 3rd PAC meeting and all items were not dealt with. There was a motion and amendment left on the floor as follows. The motion was, the other motion would be for the 2023 report of the Auditor General follow-up of 2018, 2019, and 2020 performance audit, recommendations regarding diversity and inclusion in the public service. I, I would like to add witnesses, and I'm quoting here, related to the focus of the report, Department of Agriculture, Department of Community Services, Department of Justice, and the Public Service Commission, and that was moved by Mr. Young. The amendment that arose from that was uh, moved by uh, the Honorable uh, Brenda McGuire, and the amendment was that we work together as a committee to find somebody. If the committee cannot fully agree on the Premier's Deputy Minister to come in, that the committee meet a half hour before the next meeting to sit down and have a discussion on who in the public service we can bring in on who oversees the most senior management hirings in the public sector, so that we have actual input as a public accounts committee on how these decisions are made and that we have proper representation. So we ran out of time before we could um, uh, finish discussing and vote on that amendment. So I now open the floor for discussion on the amendment. Mr. Young. Yeah, just um, following up on last week's conversation, we'll stick to the witnesses that we have, um, the original witnesses that were recommended by the Auditor General. I mean, we have um, representation from the Public Service Commission um, and people there that are well versed to speak on this, this topic. So um, it's our intent to stick with the original witnesses recommended by the Auditor General. Uh, Mr. 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 Tilly. I was all messed up there for a second. Right, Mr. Tilly. I was going to put yes. Brendan down. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, coming new, in, uh, new eyes into, uh, 
into this particular topic, so I uh, hope you bear with me on this one. But um, my understanding is that um, the concern, um, realizing that uh, diversity inclusion in the, in the public sector is, is a major, uh, a major issue um, that uh, affects many, many, many different groups of people. And when we look at the, the, um, the Premier's office or the um, Executive Council at that particular area, they have um, the biggest impact when it comes to hiring <coughs> across, uh, across the system. So um, having a witness from that area, I think, is important because they can bring the perspective of the um, overall um, face of government as opposed to um, specific, uh, specific departments. So, um, you know, they may have information that's worked in other areas, other departments, or in other jurisdictions that uh, some of the folks in these, uh, in these areas may not have. And I think, um, I think it's important for the Public Accounts Committee to have that opportunity to, to ask those questions and, and to get, um, get clarifications when needed. And, and in th the intent of the motion is, you know, whether the Premier's Deputy Minister is acceptable or not, um, per, per, I think the, the intent of the motion is that we can sit down and um, have a collaborative discussion to figure out who an appropriate witness would be. And I think. Uh, personally, think that's a pretty reasonable ask um, for you know an organization like this or a committee like this to sit down and, and chat about it. And um, you know our, our colleagues still have the majority, um, so you know nothing is going to get pushed through there without their um, without their vote. So I think the fact that uh, at least opening it up to that that half an hour an hour conversation I think would be. Uh, a nice gesture of uh, cooperation and collaboration. Thank you, Mr. Tilley. Any any further discussion, Ms. LeBlanc? Well, I just wanted to clarify because on the on the record of decision, it says the Premier's Deputy Minister already on there. So if we're going to be voting for this recommendation, then we're voting for the Premier's Deputy Minister to be. No. Well, no. Then how come it's on the witness list? Because that's how it came. <laughs> I just, so, yeah, I just don't understand so, what we're so exactly I'll, voting uh, on. So. It had, it had been refused to call the Premier's Deputy Minister, is that correct? No. No, I'm not. Uh, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the clerk for clarification because this was a while ago. Okay. So the record of decision that you have here, this is how it came forward from subcommittee. So that's why it shows ah. all of them. And then Mr. Young brought forward a motion that is different from what came forward. Right. Yeah, right. yes. So, um, any further discussion on, on the amendment? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Amen. Aye. aye. Is it the amendment? Yes. yes. Aye. Contra-minded nay. Nay. The motion is defeated. So now we move back to the original motion, which reads uh, that the other motion would be for the 2023 report of the Auditor General, follow-up of 2018, 2019, and 2020 performance audit, recommendations regarding diversity and inclusion in the public service. I would like to add witnesses related to the focus of the report. Department of Agriculture, Department of Community Services, Department of Justice, and the Public Service Commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. So we should go, we should deal with the rest of the Department of Justice. Do they want to call that one? We have to deal with this report as well. So these are all items that haven't been dealt with yet. So this one, this one, and then the the letters. Okay, so we have, um, in, in terms of the 2023 report of the Auditor General follow-up of 2018, 2019, and 2020 performance audit recommendations, re the 2018 correctional facilities and current issues in the justice system. Um, the Department of Justice was suggested as a witness. 
the Department of Justice was suggested as a witness. So um, does anyone want to make a motion on that? Just Ms. LeBlanc? Well, I just I didn't move that the um, that 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 there be a meeting dedicated to the 2023 report of the Auditor General. Uh, read the 2018 correctional facilities and current issues in the justice system, and the witness be the Department of Justice. Uh, Mr. Young. So when we um, when this came uh, this topic came forward. Um, it was the 2023 report of the Auditor General, a follow up on the 2018, 19, to 20 performance audit recommendations. And then it was, it was shifted a bit and added, and to include current issues within the justice system would have been added at a, a later time. What my recommendation would be, well, one of two things. We could either look at this when we're doing agenda setting, or as the um, Department of Justice is coming at a, uh, the previous motion, that could be part of the of the questioning around that Auditor General report. So it, if, just to simplify this, it appears that we're adding a whole new topic based on part of an Auditor General report, but and other current issues. So as Justice is already here within diversity, if there's any questions pertaining to uh, the Auditor General reports, there'd be time to, to ask it then. Uh, Ms. LeBlanc. Yeah, I don't think there is time to ask uh, the, the questions that need to be asked of the Department of Justice at that meeting. There's too many other things being talked about, and that meeting, which you've just referenced, is about diversity and inclusion in public service. So um, there's current there's there's a lot to ask in justice, uh, and it does come directly from a follow-up report of the Auditor General. So I think it's very uh, appropriate that we that we uh, schedule a meeting uh, based on an on a Auditor General report now uh, and, uh, and not wait for the regular agenda setting. So I move, I, I stand by my motion. And uh, Mr. McDonald? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just for clarity, the, and I, I, I missed that, thank you uh, for catching that, uh, Emily and the Young and current issues in the justice system. That's, her, the report is on the 2018-19-20. We're, we're looking, at, looking at an auditor's report and basically bringing them in and then asking them about current issues. So I'm trying to get where we are with it. That's where I see the disconnect and I'll leave my comments with that. So folks, we are coming up to um, 11 o'clock. I'm looking for agreement to extend this meeting by five minutes. And I do not have unanimity, so we will continue on. Um, any further discussion about this particular issue? Ms. LeBlanc? Um, fine, like just call it 2018 Correctional Facilities. <laughs> And and yeah. then let's vote. Can, can we do that? Because the fact is, we're going to ask questions about current issues in the justice system anyway. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the title. Uh, so I move that we that we uh, I call the question on this. But I'm happy to retract the current issues in the justice system. So in order to do out. that, I would have to have unanimity for you to take that on. I mean, I don't think it was my motion in, in <coughs> originally anyway. Here. So uh, let, let, I'm going to call the question. Um, all those in favor of the, or do you have further discussion? Yeah, I, I have uh, a question for sure. What's um, so the motion that you're calling the question on? Could you repeat the motion? 2023 report of the Auditor General, follow up of 2018, 2019, 2020 performance audit recommendations. Um, that we call the Department of Justice re-2018 correctional facilities and current issues okay. in the justice system. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Contrary minded nay. Nay. The motion is defeated. We have now reached 11 o'clock. Um, our next meeting is May 31st in camera. Office of the Auditor General, review of the trial process, and, um, and that's it, folks. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.